Uh, well, uh, some like Psalm, Psalm 95. Um, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. We've been doing that. Come, let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is a gr- the great God, the great king above all gods. His hands are the depths of the earth. The mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it. His hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God. We are the people of his pasture. The flock under his care. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah. As you did the day of Massa in the desert, where your fathers tested and tried me. Though they had seen what I did, for 40 years I was angry with that generation. I said, there are people whose hearts go astray. They have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger that you'll never enter my rest. Three movements in worship. Come let us sing to the Lord. Come let us worship and bow down. And today... If you hear my voice, don't harden your heart. We come to worship because we expect God to speak to us and because we're going to be open and receptive to what he says. That's the first thing. 1 Corinthians 12. Now about spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be ignorant You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, uh, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them. In all men, to each one manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. To still another interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He gives them to each one just as He determines. The body is a unit, though it's made up of many parts, and through all its parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. But we're all baptised by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free. And we're all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. They're all one part. So if they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. The parts we think are less honourable, we treat with special honour. The parts that are unpresentable are treated with a special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honour to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, 
but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. One part suffers, every part suffers with it. One part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles. Also, those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of speaking, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret but eagerly desire the greater gifts. So, one body, many parts, one Holy Spirit works among all those parts. We come to worship this morning. We come to honour him, we come to praise him, we come to declare his glory. So we should hear him when he speaks to us, whatever he's got to say. Colin. Thank you, Steve. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, this is most unlikely thing that has happened, but um, shall I tell you something this morning? That um, I put my Bible in the car. I don't always carry my Bible with me these days, which I feel a bit guilty about, but I put it in the car especially because I thought one of these days somebody's going to ask me to speak. <laughs> <laughs> so I put the Bible in the car this morning, not expecting, looking forward to Simon. Simon's a great person. He um, is a young, well, I say young farmer, younger than me anyway, young farmer, and uh, he's a great man of God and also experience in farming world and I really appreciate his word but uh, well, that be as it may as Steve prayed we pray that he'll be blessed he'll soon be better well I need your help the, I've been very much moved and concerned concerning Jesus coming again he's coming again and I'm very concerned about our family. That's a personal thing. But on a wider scale, I see so many people and they are not interested in the word of God. They're not interested. The majority of people, I heard even this morning, the majority of people are not interested in God's word. But God has a lot to say and Jesus is coming again. A terrific word that um, I've heard recently He's coming again, and the world is gearing up. We, we think things are going to go on and on like they are. They're not. The world is gearing up for a, 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 a climax when Jesus is coming again. There's a lot to happen in between. <coughs> I wanted to turn to start with, just for, to, if you've got a Bible. Well, by the way, I want your help because I've got a, a few notes here, and um, I, I'm not quick enough in turning to the references these days. It takes me ages sometimes to find uh, turning over the pages and getting the right reference. So I need your help to find the references in a minute. But we're going to read from Acts chapter 1 and the first few verses there. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to, to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my father promised, which you have heard of me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised 
with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and all the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up before, his very eye, before their very eyes. A cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. He will come back. A promise, he will come back. And um, ever since the, these two major happenings, the first one um, I'm going to mention is the resurrection. The resurrection was so important to the whole um, uh, Christian, to the whole world, because without the resurrection, we have no hope. We are miserable because we've got nothing. What have you got if, you, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead? We follow a dead thing. No, he was raised from the dead. The resurrection is so important. Um, just by the way, I was listening to a word about water in Israel. Some people asked, why is Israel so blessed? Just amazing little nation. It's such a blessing. It's, it's, it's got so much. And when they need to turn to doing anything, whether it's um, in science, whether it's in agriculture, whatever it is in, they have their terrific blessing. There's something about them. And they're, they're, they have exceeded all uh, expectations in many ways. And just to mention that, um, that I heard that the, there's in the Middle East there, there's a, generally a shortage of water. But Israel has built up their, with their knowledge and understanding, which is God given of course, a surplus of water. They have a surplus of water. They're hoping to pass it on to other countries, some of it, around them. A terrific asset. And they've piped um, water to Jerusalem through an eight, over eight foot ground tube <coughs> pipe. Well, I think it's down from Galilee. I'm not sure where it's from. But they've piped water to Jerusalem. They are well stocked up with water. <coughs> and of course water is a part of life, isn't it? You couldn't live without water. Well, the first thing is that um, the, the first, I've got four points in my notes here. You know, I'm speaking from some old scrappy bit of paper, which I promised the Lord I'd never do. But it's not that scrappy. I hope it's not too scrappy. I remember a farmer in Somersault. I'll tell you this. I better stop chatting, hadn't I? A farmer in Somersault, speaking from this very pulpit, pulled out a dirty bit of paper from his pocket and uh, started speaking from this bit of dirty paper. Well, I say dirty, it was scruffy, scruffy paper from his pocket. He just pulled it out and, and I said to the Lord, I'd never do that. If you ever call me to preach, I'll never do that. Well, this isn't that scruffy, is it? <laughs> I hope not, anyway. The resurrection... It's the promise of a resurrection. If you turn to John 14 and uh, verse, I'll, I've got this one ready, but if you turn to another one for me in a minute, would you turn, Val, would you get um, 1 Peter 1.3? 1 Peter 1.3. And Steve, would you do one Titus 1.3? One, we'll see what they say to start with. The promise, the, the resurrection is a promise. And uh, this is from John 14, verse 19. We read, The Spirit of Truth, the, word cannot, the world 
cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you before long. The world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. On that day, you will be realised that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, and I am in you. Because you, because I live, you will also live. Live. The promise of living. I spoke to somebody years ago and they said about, um, I said, well, we have the, the promise of eternal life. He says, I don't know whether I want eternal life. Rather shocking, but that's, that's his attitude. He didn't know whether he wanted it. But we want life. I want life. I, I'm hoping for a, a good body next time. Not one that's <laughs> losing its faculties. But anyway, that's another story. What's the, what's the um, 1 Peter 1, 3, what does that tell us? 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. New birth and a living hope. The power of the resurrection. The promise of the resurrection. What does it all say, Steve? What was the scripture? Yeah, Titus. Uh, 1 Peter 1.3. No, that's mine. Sorry, Titus 1.2. Titus 1 2. Yeah. Uh, faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. The promise before the beginning of time. Amazing. God had this planned from the beginning, before the beginning of the time. The promise of the resurrection. And the promise to you and I that we will be raised with him. Um, Romans, would, can you just quickly look up Romans 8, 9, uh, Ro, Romans 8, 18. I think that speaks of it. I should have all this. When I'm, when I'm speaking normally, perhaps I'm not, I should be speaking normally now, I have all my texts written out because I can't find them fast enough. Romans 8, 9, um, 18. Was it 19? 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So can you say that again, please? I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Amazing. Amazing work. Glory that will be revealed. We're, we're worthless in many ways, and yet God. God is able to do that marvellous thing in our lives. Nigel was talking about that, really, I think. And so the promise, the promise to us that if we know him, we will live with him and be raised from the dead too. The second thing is power. Um, the power of the resurrection. You know, we like a bit of power. I'm amazed that in the farming industry we used to plough with tractors about 35 horsepower tractors. Now they have to have 120 or 140 horsepower tractors. They need the power. They want the power but, and we want the power, the, the horsepower, manpower. The power of the resurrection. Power. Can you can somebody can can you look at me, Steve, please? Ephesians one, seventeen to twenty. Sorry about this, it's, it just takes time. The power of the resurrection. See what Ephesians one seventeen to twenty says. <coughs> uh, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, 
may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power to us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Do you feel weak this morning? Well, I do, but Jesus promises the power, the enormous power, which is tremendous worse, that is. That, just, can you just check, say that little bit again, please? Verse uh, 17. Um, Last bit. His incomparably, from verse 19, his incomparably great power to us who believe, that power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given. Amazing what God has promised us. A promise of power. Um, we, we may want power in our car, cars or tractors or whatever it is, but God has promised us power within our lives. I heard somebody say to me, you know, Colin, the biggest problem in the church is unbelief. I thought, huh? That takes some understanding. The biggest problem in the church is unbelief. And, and you think about it, the more you think about it is how we don't take these words that, that Steve just read to us, the power of God in our lives. We, we tend to forget, we, we don't really believe it a lot of the time, the power. So there is the promise of the, of the resurrection there and the power of the resurrection. And thirdly, there is the proclaiming of the resurrection. And that is in Matthew 28. Well, you know these verses anyway, probably. Matthew 28. Somebody help me out. Matthew, get it before I get it. 28. Uh, Matthew 28, verse 18, or 18 to 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Proclaiming the word of God, proclaiming the gospel. One thing that I really appreciate about Simon when he comes, I think Julie said this, he preaches the gospel. He's a strong preacher of the gospel. And sometimes I think my preaching of the gospel is so weak. But he, you could tell with Simon, he preached the gospel, proclaimed the word. And people may not believe it, people pass it over and, and one thing or another, but, but how it is um, emphasised to each person that is a disciple of Jesus Christ to proclaim the gospel. Don't think that you are out of this. If you're a Christian, you are required by God to proclaim his word and his, and his power of his salvation. Preach the gospel. Proclaim it. Don't lose out there. Um, I try and give testaments out to those that stay at the farm. And uh, it's amazing what response you get, or non-response, <laughs> that you get. And I give a testament, and one lady, I may have told you this before, one lady I was giving the testament to and said, I don't know what I said at that time, but giving it a testament, she says, oh, oh no, thank you. 
don't want that, thank you. I said, well, you're the first one that refused it. She said, in that case, I'll take it. <laughs> we had, we had a, a couple, which I didn't understand were a couple, but anyway, this is a man and a woman came. And um, the, the, the man was a retired dairy farmer from Wales. He was 87, so he was older than me, but he was a retired dairy farmer from Wales. And his, I don't know what to call her, partner, carer, woman that came with him anyway. She was about half his age, and she came with him as well. And I gave them a testament each. And the, the, the retired farmer said, it gives me hope. I thought that was good. Hope. What had he got at 87 if he hadn't got any hope? I gave him hope. And the, the lady said, that's a precious gift. She, she could see that it was precious. God's word is precious. Proclaim the word where you can. I sent a, a letter out to the whole of my children and grandchildren last Christmas. And I was very disappointed in their response. But they had a letter telling, telling them that granddad or dad or whatever was getting old and that they needed to know they needed to know the way of salvation. And I, had, I did have, my, my daughter came back and said, yes, we, we have it, Dad. But um, I was disappointed in the response. But you've got to proclaim the gospel, whether it's to family, to who it is. Sometimes it's very hard to proclaim God's word, but he, he requires. And fourthly, um, it, it's, uh, the word is, um, um, these notes is, his presence, his presence. We read in Matthew 28 there, and verse 20, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. What a tremendous promise of his presence. He is with you. He is with you in every situation. You know, um, years ago I was very upset about something that had happened in the family and I was milking the cows and you know I've never felt this since but I felt it then I felt the devil was taunting me look what's happening really taunting me and I can't say anything else but the, that it was the devil because I don't know what else it would be but it was this horrible mental torture <coughs> that he was taunting me. What do you believe and, and what, where are you? And do you know what I did? The, if the, only the cows heard me. Well, I say only the cows, the Lord heard me. But uh, and I said to the devil, in the name of Jesus Christ, get out. I commanded the devil to get out because it was so, it was so and I, I'm, not, I'm not like that. I'm not like that sort of person, really. I don't do that sort of thing. But I did do that day, milking the cows. I don't know what the cows thought, but, but God knew. And I felt relief from the taunting that I believe the devil was giving me. The, the presence of Jesus in that situation, and every situation that you have in life, the, the, the bad, the good, the indifferent, he is present he promised, I am with you always to the very end of the age. He will not leave you or forsake you. And uh, it's a tremendous promise there. The resurrection, the promise of the resurrection, the power of the resurrection, proclaiming the resurrection, and the presence, his presence of Jesus in our lives. May God help us to live it out for his name's sake. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, you know your word has come to our hearts this morning in different ways, in unexpected ways. But we pray that you'll bless each and every one that's heard your word this morning and that we may be revived and strengthened and, yes, filled with the Holy Spirit afresh as we commit all to you. In Jesus' name, amen.